So let's jump right into Revelation, our uh, part six. And we're looking today at the church of Thyatira, the fourth of the seven churches that we're looking at in chapters two and three of Revelation. So let's jump right into the angel of the church of Thyatira, write, these are the words of the Son of God whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. Those, both of those are metaphors for uh, God who judges. I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet, and we'll talk about this more in a minute, but Jezebel may have been an actual woman in the church, a prophetess, or so-called self-named and promoted perhaps, but could have been a woman in the church that was through her teaching and doctrine leading people astray, or it could have been a spirit, spirit of Jezebel. We're not exactly sure whether it was something literal or something spiritual that he's talking about here. We'll talk about more in a minute though. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality, and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality. Aren't you glad that God gives us time to repent? I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead. Literally, that is, I will kill her children with death. And I think it's referring to the second death, which is eternal death, not just physical death. I will kill, uh, I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, because it wasn't everybody that this applied, that applied to, but I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I think it's a reference to Gnosticism, the Greek word knowledge, Gnosticism was a, a heresy of the early church that promised deeper things than, than simple Christianity, which is the simple gospel of Jesus. Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you except to hold on to what you have until I come. To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. That one will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery. Just as I have received authority from my Father, I will also give that one the morning star. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So in our study of Revelation, uh, God is giving us an intentionally provocative image <laughs> That's what he does throughout this book, this amazing book. Pulling back the curtain, if you will, to reveal Revelation, Apocalypsis, that this is reality. What he is expressing isn't just some sort of confusing symbolism, but that is reality. It's not what you think. It's not what you've come to believe. It's not what many people have come to live. It's not your, what your job says. It's not what your school says. It's not what philosophies teach you. This, that we're studying the book of Revelation, is reality. And I'm going to give you this provocative reality, the Lord is basically saying, to help reshape how you view reality and how you view your world so that you can see that, that you can see the things that you don't see. So you can understand the things that are, that are real because we lose track of that, we lose sight of that. And that's what the book of Revelation does. And it's relevant. A couple of people this last week said, I love how relevant it is. I said, well, wait till we get to chapter four. No, but I love how relevant it is. And it needs to be relevant. Because the book of Revelation is as relevant in the 21st century as it was in the first century. And some of the very same things as we'll look at today. But it's deeply practical. It's deeply discipleship oriented. It's about living, and it was spoken to those people in the first century, these churches, these seven churches who were each dealing with some of their, you know, with issues of persecution, much like sometimes we do today. But 
rather than seeing Revelation as some sort of hope for an escape, I hope the rapture's coming right away. And we do, we hope for that. Don't stop hoping for that. But we don't study Revelation for fascination. We don't study Revelation for some sort of idea of, oh man, can I really, you know, now I can be at peace in my life. It didn't happen for the first century church and Maranatha was the, their cry. They thought Jesus was coming right away. You know, they didn't think it was gonna take centuries. None of us know the timetable of God. Jesus didn't know when he was here physically. But we understand that this is a call to discipleship. This is a call, and what is a disciple? Matthew 4, 19. One who follows Jesus is changed by Jesus and is on mission for Jesus. Let's say it together. One who follows Jesus is being changed by Jesus is on mission for Jesus. That's what he said. Follow me and I will make you, turn you into something. Fishers of men. Fishers of men. And so... The first century church, these seven churches that he's speaking to, wanted to know how they could faithfully live for Jesus. Exiles, really, in a corrupt, materialistic, chaotic world, the Roman Empire at the time, this impressive empire, and they wanted to know how they could live faithfully and simply for Jesus Christ, much the same as us. It's the call of Christians, Christian disciples throughout all the centuries. And it's what the book of Revelation is about. And so, it reminds me of Ephesians chapter two, verse two, which says, in which you once walked, Paul is speaking to the Ephesian church, to the course of the, in the court, uh, you, you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. So there is a world system that we lose sight of. Revelation is bringing us back to understand the reality of that and, and how to live within that faithfully for Jesus. There's a great quote from Schofield, because this course, this world, in Ephesians 2, chapter 2, verse 2, is talking about this course of this world. I've talked about this before, but it's like, it's, the Greek is word pictures, and it's a picture of a river running its course. It's just always running down this course. And that's the world. Until you meet Jesus and come to receive him, receive the gospel, and you're born again, and you get taken out of that course of this world, what he's talking about in Ephesians 2, because that's dominated by the prince of the power of the air. It's a name for Satan, one of the several names in the scripture for Satan. And, and so you're just going down, you're just going with the flow. <laughs> and that's what people do in this world. And that's what the Christian church oftentimes we fall back into. We don't understand. We don't understand that what we're seeing and what we're living is not the reality. It's spiritual. And Revelation calls us back to that not get lost. It was a call to the early church. It's amazing when you study church history how quickly the church over the first several centuries began to drift just back into that way of the world. It's the world or it's the word, always. It's the world, it's the word. And I've shared this before, but it's been quite a while, probably years. Schofield, one of the great Bible commentators, there's a Schofield Bible. Um, Just don't pay attention to Anything he talks about the gifts of the Spirit, which he doesn't believe will happen anymore. So other than that part, he's a dispensationalist. But other than that, he's, he's you know, obviously a great scholar. Um, where, he, where he agrees with me, essentially, I guess, is what I'm saying. I didn't, it's what it sounds like. But anyway, that's bad. Really bad. But anyway, he, I love this, and so I've given it to you on your outline. It's, it's a quote of cosmos. That's the Greek word that's used for world. And so the world, and it's, it's talking about a system, that there's a world system, the word cosmos means. And so here's what he says in his book, and I love this. This, this is, I love to read this. In his summary of cosmos, his word study of cosmos, Schofield says, in the sense of the present world system, the ethically bad sense of the word, like the world, you're either in the word of the word or the world, The ethically bad sense of the word refers to the order or the arrangement under which Satan has organized the world of unbelieving mankind upon his cosmic principle of force, greed, selfishness, ambition, and pleasure. There's a bunch of verses there to look up. This world system, this is great. This world system is imposing and powerful with armies and fleets, is often outwardly religious, scientific, cultured, and elegant, 
but it's seething with national and commercial rivalries and ambitions is upheld in any real crisis only by armed force, hello, what's happening in our world today, and is dominated by satanic principles. That's the world, folks. That's the cosmos that we live in. And if we're not careful, we can get drawn back into just that flow. That's the word that he used where he says, you once, Ephesians 2.2, we're living according to the course of this world, by the dictates of the prince of the power of the air. And the question for Christians, in terms of our discipleship, our, in terms of our becoming more and more like Jesus in this life, is do, you know, do we understand the reality of, of the world that we're living? Am I living my life based on the reality of the spiritual world that Revelation is talking about and calling me to? Or am I just kind of going with the flow of the world around me? Is my life any different? And how is it different than the world, the families, the ambitions, the, you know, all this stuff? Of, of, it's just part of the world, the world system around me. So it's a great call. And, and, and Jesus in the Revelation is really, it seems so, some, so much of Revelation seems hard to understand, perhaps. It seems, um, you know, it's, it can be frightening to people. <laughs> it's frightening to pastors. That's why a lot of pastors don't teach on it. But it's, it's like Jesus loves his church. Jesus died, his church, died for his church. Jesus is saying the things that he's saying and revealing the things that he's revealing in Revelation because he loves you and he doesn't want you to get drawn into the world and the, the results that happen when we do. The emptiness, the pain, the hurt, the disillusionment that happens to so many people. So today we're talking about Thyatira. Thyatira that we just read about, this church was the smallest of the seven cities. We're beginning to move inland. It's western Turkey as you go from Ephesus up through the others that we've looked at, Smyrna and such, you go to, you start to turn inland from the west coast uh, to, you know, more central. Thyatira was the smallest of the seven cities. It's the longest of the seven letters, however, which is kind of cool, isn't it? I mean, there's something even in that about just, you know, God doesn't look at, like, size the way we do, you know, statistics and big numbers, especially with his church. You know, it's not about that. It's about the substance. It's about his presence. And so in uh, Philippians chapter 16, 14, we read about Lydia. Do you remember her? She was Paul's first con convert in Europe, in Philippi there. And it says there that she was a businesswoman, that she was a seller of purple. That purple dye was centered in Thyatira. Thyatira was a place that was the center of the dye industry, but it was a vibrant working class city full of trade guilds. Probably the first labor unions may very well have been there, but it was filled with trade guilds, leather makers, rug makers, iron workers, and such. But in verse 19, they're commended for something, right? They're commended for four or five things, your deeds, your love and truth, it says, your service and perseverance, and for doing more than you did at first. You're actually doing more, that's pretty good. That doesn't always happen in life. You're doing more than you did at first. Then he says, nevertheless. Now, the neverlesses of life are not cool, right? Who wants to hear the nevertheless? You're sitting down with your boss, and your boss compliments you, and then says, nevertheless. You're talking to your wife, and she says, you've been doing a pretty good job. And nevertheless, it's like, uh-oh. Right, guys? Uh-oh. <laughs> As guys, we never say nevertheless to our wife. Did you pick that up? I didn't equal that out, that's just don't ever go there. Or there will be one huge nevertheless for you. But it's the neverlesses of life that we shy away from. And in all but two of the seven churches, he's giving them commendation and then critique. He's saying, this is what you got going on, it's great, but now nevertheless. And we need to know that we grow because of the neverlesses, right? We're not to shy away from those, but again, it's because Jesus loves us, he wants us to grow. So in Ephesians, we have the loveless church. They've lost their first love. Smyrna, we had the persecuted church. 
Pergamos, we have the compromising church. Talked about that last week. And then this week, Thyatira is the tolerant church. Okay? And again, has great application for today. It's, that's part of why, and somebody, a couple of you have told me this, this series, this study, it's not a series, this study goes very well, we think, and I appreciate that you picked up on it, a number of you, with the last series that we did, which was navigating cultural chaos to move into Revelation, because that's exactly what they were doing with the se- in the seven churches. But there's three things that we can learn from Thyatira, according to Pastor David Bisgrove, and it's a diagnosis, a danger, and a destiny, and I think those are three great things that you see here. There's a diagnosis. In fact, let me give it to you. You might want to circle if you're taking notes at all, but you see in, uh, in the first where it says you tolerate that woman Jezebel. Do you see that there in verse 21? And then the second thing to underline is um, by her teaching she misleads. That's the danger. And you see that. Number two, you see that in verse, I think it's verse 22, correct? Verse tw- uh, actually, that's verse 20. And then verse, the last thing is that you might want to underline is, uh, is, I didn't plan on saying this, but I think you'll like it if you underline it. It's kind of helpful. Um, hold on to what you have until I come. And that's the third thing. So those are the three things we're going to talk about and, uh, and that we're going to look at. So the first one, the diagnosis, the nevertheless for Thyatira was what? You tolerate... You tolerate something. You tolerate that woman, Jezebel. Again, the commendation and then the criticism. You're tolerating something that I'm not tolerating, is what Jesus is saying. You're tolerating something that I see as intolerable for my church. That's what he's saying. And it's Jezebel, again, we don't know a woman or a spirit, but... We'll talk about Jezebel more in a, in a couple of minutes, but um, there's this sense of needing to evaluate, needing to evaluate different beliefs, needing to evaluate different behaviors, not in a way that's judging and hypocritical, and, but clearly, Jesus, I mean, it's raw, strong language here, and it has been to each of the churches, only two, where he doesn't give this nevertheless. And what he's saying here that we must understand in our time if we're going to be faithfully following him is that tolerance isn't always a virtue. It isn't. If you experience injustice in the workplace, say from your boss, your boss treating you grossly different from fellow workers, would you tolerate that? No, you wouldn't, you shouldn't. If you're recovering from major surgery and the doctor prescribes pain pills, you likely choose to take the pain pills rather than tolerate the pain, right? That is, unless you're my wife. And she rather would have pain than feeling what a pain pill gives you. And not me. It's, doctor, bring on the pills. <laughs> and I, I don't say that. I'm not on anything at the moment, okay? And I don't recommend it for everybody. But if you go through major surgery, which one of us just went through in my marriage, first time either one of us have, and I I think there's times pain pills are a good idea. I'm just saying, in case anyone's hearing me say this. Tolerance isn't always a virtue. If your children are constantly acting out in hurtful ways to themselves and to you, You're not going to tolerate that, right? You shouldn't. By the way, talking, speaking, let me just take a moment on this. This is not a hobby horse. This is an important teaching. We were going to do a parenting class uh, kind of series, not not on Sundays, but a special kind of Saturday, Friday, Saturday thing, and we will do that. We haven't gotten to it yet because we're still in recovery mode at our home, uh, both of us um, trying to get healthy. But um, but the... um, you, you got to parent your kids the way Jesus would parent you. How does, how, does, or how, how, how does the father parent you, according to his word? And one of the, the, the challenges for parents, especially as life gets so busy, is we don't recognize the importance and the power of our words. 
So that when, does God ever compromise his word? The answer to that is no. (laughs) Now, are there times, we're not God, so are there times when you say something to your child, you give them a command to do something, and you probably shouldn't have? Does that happen? Yeah, it happens. And what do you do? You go back and you take the time, you say, I'm sorry, that was not right. That wasn't the Lord. That was me. I was tired, I was whatever. You don't give excuses, but you give understanding to them. But... This is one of the most significant things that every parent in raising young kids needs to understand is when you say to do something, and hopefully you're, you know, if you're parenting, that's the most important thing you're doing. You understand that? It's more important than your job. It's more important than anything else. It's your first gift that God's given you after your relationship with Jesus Christ and your spouse. You've got to be, there's a husband and wife thing that happens, but then the next, next thing is those children that you've been called to raise unto him. You're to steward them back to him. They don't belong to you. They belong to him. You have about however many years you're going to have to raise them back to him. And by the way, nobody's the mother Mary, nor are you or me. And so, you know, you're not going to do it perfectly. But, and they have their own journey. They have their own calling. They have their own things that they're called to overcome. To he or she who overcomes, you know, as Revelation says time and again. But it's so important It's so important that you give attention to your children, that you are eye to eye so many, as often as you can be with your children when you're talking to them and telling them what to do, and that you follow through on your word. I remember one time with Jeff, we were in a store, he was really young, and, uh, (laughs) because they test everything, right? They're gonna test your word. And so we were in a store, and we'd always be able to go over, it was in Pullman, where we planted a church and we went over to the, the deli and they would give like donuts, little donut things to the kids. So he'd over, he, you know, I'm holding him, he's that small and he reaches up and he grabs it. And I said, okay, Jeffrey, say thank you to the nice lady. And he just made a decision. It's gonna be one of those times when he was just, no way, in no way. And so I, you know, I was a little surprised because he didn't typically do that. So Jeffrey say thank you to the nice lady, zipped it. Just looking at me like, what are you gonna do? thinking that I wasn't going to do anything because we're out in public and whatever. Well, (laughs) it's the most important thing I'm doing, remember? We walked quite a ways. I said, excuse me to the lady, I'll be right. And she's like, oh, it's fine. He doesn't have to say anything, no problem. She's like nervous. I said, no, we'll be right back. Excuse me. Walked him out back. It was quite a hike. Did what we did for discipline, which is according to the word, but you don't have to do it that way but it's part of, going to be part of the class. We'll talk about it when we get there. But um, whatever your consequence is, again, God always has consequence, right? For violation of the word. <laughs> and so whatever your consequence is, anyway, I did that with him lovingly, but very firmly. We came back and through tears, he said, thank you, because I said again, tell the nice lady, thank you. Thank you, tears running down his cheeks. But why, I'm not saying we were the perfect parents, we weren't, but I'll tell you this, we had clear understanding of the importance of the word, the word because of the importance of the word in our lives. And that we are to parent in the same way that God parents us. So it's just one main thing, but it's a main thing. And by the way, if you'll do this, and it takes a little while to transition if you haven't been doing it, and it's so hard to do it sometimes because we get busy, and it's like you just get distracted, and you're working on this, you're cooking dinner, or you're doing this, or you're doing that. Or, you know, one of you doesn't want to do it. You know, wait till daddy gets home, that kind of thing. No, you deal with stuff on the spot, and you deal with stuff very clearly and simply and firmly, lovingly. And by the way, every relationship is out of you have to be established in a love relationship. That's why we didn't let other people discipline Jeff, because they didn't have the relationship, right? Grandparents, whatever, they didn't really have the relationship with them. And so, um, unless the parents give the grandparents permission and the child knows that it's given by the parent to the grandparent, then that can be a different story. See, I'm getting into this class. Why are, why are you leading me down this road? super important. There's, it's so important, you guys. And some of you, it's been a while since we've done a class. Some of you have kids, and you're doing a great job. We see a lot of great kids around. But there's some things that you want to get in place really early on and be consistent 
out of love, the first church was first love. That's the priority, always the priority. Do what we do out of love. But man, there's nothing more important than the word and your word that you're speaking to your children. And so you do whatever you need to do to make sure you're consistent in that, okay? All right. And that there's consequence when there's been a violation. But tolerance isn't always a virtue. <laughs> and tolerating the intolerable is what Jesus says is dangerous and hurtful for any family, for any culture, for any community. Now this thing about tolerance is at the center of a lot of turmoil in the culture today and really ultimately leads to absolutes that we live in a culture that's absolutely rejected absolutism, you know, which is a very interesting, isn't it? Because people say there are no absolutes, they're just making an absolute claim. So what does that mean? But that's, that's the world we live in. And people will say, and you've heard it said many times, maybe you've said it before, what bothers me about religion, what bothers me about Christianity, what bothers me about Christians is that their way is the only way. So intolerant. They're so intolerant of any belief system that isn't Jesus. You hear that, don't you? We hear that. But this idea that a tolerant view of all religions is the only tolerable view is itself what? Intolerant. Does that make sense? It's like the absolute thing. No absolutes is an absolute. And when people say that they're intolerant of Christians being the only way, they themselves are being intolerant. And the point is this. All of us have some ultimate view of reality that is intolerant to the view of others. Would you lift your hand if you're willing to acknowledge that, that you do have? It's about a third of the room. Okay, think about it. And send me an email if you want to talk about it, because I'll talk about it. It's really important. All of us. And in fact, the fact that that bothers you proves it. <laughs> if that bothers you, what I just said, and I'll say it again, then it proves what I just said. All of us have some ultimate view of reality that is intolerant of the view of others. We all do. Every single one of us does. And so here's the question. Here's what this is coming down to. Which one is right? <laughs> That's the question. Which one is right? If you don't believe in absolutes, you don't believe there's a right, correct? But we do. Let me see if I can illustrate this which one is right thing with an illustration. So I'm in the sauna again this week. I, I seem to have a lot of illustrations from the sauna recently. <laughs> I work out at 24-Hour Fitness, and I'm in the sauna, and guys talk, talk in the sauna, and pastors love saunas because you have a captive audience. So I love it there. And usually I mind my own business, but there's this guy, and he was sort of an older gentleman. Not, he was an older guy. I won't even use the word gentleman. If, if for some reason you've stumbled into church today, I love you anyway. But, but uh, so there's three of us in there, three guys, and this one guy, so he looks at me with my, I have my shoes on, I, had my, I was in the sauna with my workout gear on. Uh, I had changed at home, and so I just went in there, and I had my shoes on. And he said, do you see this sign? And there was this little sign that I'd never noticed before. It says, don't wear your workout shoes in the sauna. And I'm sitting there with my shoes on, as was the third guy, too. But he said it to me. He said, do you, he says, can you read the sign? I said, and so I read it, I said, oh, yeah. And he said, it gets the floor all dirty, which he was right, it was. And he said, it's really hard to clean this. And that's all he said. And so I said, wow. I said, I'd never read that. I'll, the least I can do is take off my shoes. So I took off my shoes. The other guy next to me was seething. He, he's like, you know, later he tells me, well, I'm a member here just as much as he is. He can't tell me what to do. So I just, it's like, he was right. He was right. So I just said, yeah, I slipped my shoes off. Which, by the way, the next day he saw me, like, just out in the thing, and he came up and said, thank you. But here's the next thing that happened is we're sitting there. So I'm just sitting there minding my own business. My shoes are off now. And he, <laughs> so I think he's happy. And he says, uh, he said, uh, you going to listen to our president tonight? Because it was the night that, that President Biden spoke about Israel. Now, you've got to understand, I care a lot about Israel. It's not political for me, folks. It's biblical. 
okay? We are to care about Israel. And we are grafted in to what, what God has done with Israel, is doing with Israel. He's not done with them. And so I care a lot. And so he says, uh, and so my response was, well, I hope he follows through on what he says, like that. <laughs> and he says, well, I wonder why those things happen in the world. And I said, well, it's because of evil. There's something called evil that's real. And he said, well, I guess that's what happens when you take somebody's land. <laughs> so I put my shoes back on. No. <laughs> no, I didn't put my shoes on. I left my shoes off. <laughs> but I basically said, there was a little bit more of a conversation, but I basically said, well, we're going to see how much they like that decision pretty soon because there are consequences if you believe that. You know, and uh, and again, remember the next day he said thank you to me. So, but my point is, is that there was truth. He was right about the shoes. I honored the truth, the truth of that. I think I'm right about my position on Israel, and I made that very clear to him. <laughs> what I thought about that. My point is, we live in a world of tolerance that worships tolerance what does tolerance ultimately mean it does not mean according to God clearly according to Jesus tolerance isn't that you you know celebrate everybody's belief system equally what it comes down to is what's the truth and when it comes down to the truth what do we have to rely on the word of the eternal God. That's what we have. He's given us his word. And so, you can pray for me this week that God will use me in the sauna and that I will be merciful. <laughs> I'll share Jesus with him. See, here's what I'd do to you if you know, I wasn't a Christian, buddy. No. <laughs> but it's why this is so important is number two, and we'll move fast, is the danger. There's a diagnosis which is all about intolerance, right? Tolerating intolerance, something that's intolerant to God. And then the danger is, by her teaching, she misleads. And that's the danger of a culture and a community that tolerates the intolerable. Every one of us is shaped by the culture we live in. Amen? Amen. All of us are. And we don't always... Things aren't always as they appear. And he says in verse 20, it's seducing you away from God. He says in verse 22, this teaching of uh, Jezebel. It's spiritual adultery. And then he says in, in verse 22, and then verse 24, he says it's related to the teaching of Satan. Again, strong, strong words. So what's the big deal, as society says? What's the big deal with just tolerating? Why can't we just all be together and live together and love? And what's, what's the big deal with tolerating these teachings? Well, the big deal is, Jesus says, in verse 18, he says, you need my blazing eyes. Verse 23, that, that search your hearts and minds. Otherwise, you're going to be lost, and you're not even going to know it. And ultimately, what it leads to, and here's the real problem, here's why it's a real big deal, it leads to idolatry which is putting any other person, place, or thing as a priority before the word of God, before a life of God. It's idolatry to God. It's a violation of the first commandment. That's why it's a big deal. God is calling us, and he has constantly called his people to be what? To be different. And are you and I willing to be that in his name and for his glory? 2 Corinthians 6, 16 to 18 says it really well. For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. That's holiness. And I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters. That's holiness. It's not being separate, as I said, for judgmental sake or hypocrisy or being isolated from people. But the church is called to be a culture and a community that looks different from the culture around us. Why? Because we have a family. We are to be a family that resembles our Father in heaven. That's why. We're to be a fa family that resembles. We're sons and daughters of the God. And God is saying not to, he's saying this not to limit our lives, 
but to free us and fulfill us because there's a spiritual reality that exists. He's pulling back the veil. That's what he's doing for the church at Thyatira. They'd begun to drift. And when he used this word Jezebel, by the way, that got their attention because whether it was, no Bible scholar that I've read believes that it's, there was a woman named Jezebel at Thyatira. Nobody named their children, especially Jews, as a Jezebel because they understood what Jezebel stood for. Jezebel was a daughter of one of Israel's neighbors and Ahab, who was king of Israel, married her out of political expediency. If you go back and read 1 Kings, 2 Kings, talks about this political protection is basically. So here's Ahab, the king of Israel, and he's rationalized it all. So what does it matter? I'm still a Jew, I'll still worship God, I'll still do the sacrifices, I'll still honor the Ten Commandments, I'll do all of that. And, but what's wrong with intermarriage? What's wrong with doing that, right? But you know what happens when you go back and study it? Jezebel brought 850 priests with her, by the way, the same idols as Thyatira, as we're in Thyatira. She brought 850 priests with her that she started killing off every Jewish priest that she could find and almost wiped out, if you read the history, they almost wiped out Israel because of it. And he's teaching here that there's no such thing as spiritual or moral neutrality. Not to God there isn't. Not to God there isn't. It seems okay, but it's a lie. It's a lie that you were to tolerate that. And it's a lie that will ultimately destroy you. And the reason for that is because you're gonna serve something, right? As Bob Dylan once sang, love that song still. You're gonna serve somebody, you're gonna serve something. And if it's not God, it's course of this world, prince of the power of the air. It's something he set up. It's the world system. It's either going to be about truth or it's going to be about error. And you and I get to choose which it'll be. Third thing, last thing, quickly, there's a destiny. And this is in verse 25 where he says, hold on to what you have until I come. And I love this because in verse 25, he's also said, do not hold on to her teaching. Hold on to what you have until I come. You got to choose, in other words. Hold on. You're going to hold on to something. You're gonna hold on to her teaching, you're gonna hold on to this, the lies, you're gonna hold on to tolerant, tolerating the intolerable in this world, or are you gonna hold on? It might not be easy sometimes, it might not be popular sometimes, it might be a challenge within your own family, it might be a challenge with your friends, but you're gonna hold on to what's true and what honors the word of God. And you're gonna to have to choose, and what you decide to choose is gonna be all important because it will, that cho choice, one way or other, will begin to affect you and your family and the people that you're closest to. He says in verse 26, to the one who's victorious and does my will to the end. How do you hold on? And I love this idea is to, to others of you, to the other, you know, notice he said that there's the people who are tolerating Jezebel, and, but he says then to the others of you, just hold on to what you have till I come. And I love that God says that, because you know what, there's some of you that need to hear that. You're always trying, you know, some of us always try for more. We're always trying to get more, gain more, do more, whatever. And there's a, there's a place, not out of complacency, not out of just sort of, oh, I'm done, woe is me. You know, not kind of, but there's a place to hold on to what you've already, just what God's already done in your life. And that he sees that as something he's pleased with. Isn't that a cool thought? It just delivers us from just always having to do more for him. That's not, that's not his art. It's not his art at all. So there's a place for some of us. I think some of you especially, I just felt like in preparing us needed to hear, it's okay to just hold on until he comes. But how do you do that? Verse 26, the one who's victorious does my will to the end. Just do the will of God. Just do the right thing. Just do what he's called you to do. And that's how you hold on. What we hold on to is the teaching to the truth that we're victorious through Christ. What we hold on to is the understanding and to the experience that Jesus has already won the victory through the cross. He's the one. And it's not our victory, it's his victory. And as I hold on to that, no matter what's going on in my life, no matter doubts that might come or challenges to that might come, I hold on to Jesus as the one who is my victory through his death and resurrection. 
And that's how, that's how you do it. That's how you make it to the end. He's won the victory through the cross. He gives us two things at the end. He says, I will give authority, and I'll give him the morning star. It's interesting, authority. And he talks about, and that's what we're going to be doing, ruling and reigning. We're not going to be, you know, sitting on, like, what's the old saying? We're not going to be sitting on a cloud somewhere just playing a harp and singing Amazing Grace. Thank God for eternity. You know, it's a little, you know, some, some people say, well, I'd rather go to hell. That's where all the fun is. Well, no, it's not. That is not right. But neither is it going to be sitting on a cloud somewhere playing a harp. But we're going to have authority. In like fact, he says here, he goes, the same authority that was that the Father gave to Jesus. We're going to ta- that's going to be released through us to rule and reign for eternity with him. Worlds that he's perhaps yet to even create as creator God. Isn't that awesome? That we're going to have authority. And then he says, I'll give him the morning star. It's amazing. In Isaiah, there's a reference to Satan when he fell as being the morning star. But then in Revelation 22, verse 16, at the very end, it says, Jesus Christ is the morning star. He has overcome Satan. He, we live in his victory. And there will be a moment when you see him and his light and his life. The morning star will rise upon you as he welcomes you to his glory. And what a moment, what a day that will be. But it's his victory. And we can hold on to that now. Let's prepare for communion as the band returns. And Lord, we praise you today for the victory that is ours. We know the price was, the cost, Lord, was unimaginable. But we thank you, Lord, for the victory that's ours in the spiritual realm and affects everything, affects physical life as well. But Lord, help us today and through this entire study, Lord, just continue to recalibrate us, to continue to reveal yet again to us the, the truth, the truth of your word and the truth about the, the realities that we live in, Lord, that it's not. Lord, we get drawn We do sometimes get seduced, the Jezebel thing. We do sometimes, Lord, and and you understand that. But Lord, you call us to something greater, something higher. You call us away from this world, ultimately, to be separate, which means to just be with you, to just be with you, to just be fulfilled in you, to be satisfied with what you give us. God, we're prone to want more, do more, all that stuff we talked about, but God, we want to just close this service by acknowledging that you're, you're it for us. You're the one. You're all we need. Ultimately, we know you're all we want. Lord, <laughs> that's not true for me every moment. I confess that, but I want it to be, Lord. I want that to be the case for me. I want you to be all I want in this life. Thank you for your death on the cross. Thank you for forgiveness of our sins today. And prepare our hearts now as we sing the song of worship. Lord, we know revelation throughout, and we'll be coming back to this throughout this stuff, study is all about worship, all about the Lamb who's worthy, all about the majesty, all about the glory. What do we do as living in exiles in a chaotic, (laughs) corrupt world? We worship God. We keep coming back, continually to worshiping our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So we end this service by doing that as we prepare for communion. We worship you in Jesus' name.
Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. This is what it means to build our lives upon his love. Lord, we thank you for the cross. We take this bread now. Let's take the bread and lift it up. Thank you, Lord. Proclaim the sufficiency of your sacrifice over every sin, every sin, past, present, future. Let the grace of Jesus Christ motivate us, inspire us, empower us to do the right things, to live in obedience to not tolerate what you call intolerable, Lord. Thank you that you died. You died. You wouldn't have had to die if all things were tolerable. <laughs> you wouldn't have had to go to the cross if everything was okay. Help, that, help us to understand that, Lord, and to humbly 
for love's sake, receiving your love and then extending it to the world. Help us, Lord, to be, to live in, to build our lives upon your love. In Jesus' name, let's go ahead and eat it together. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And let's lift up the cup. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the blood of Jesus. Father, for sending your one and only Son. Jesus, thank you that you came and that your, again, death, your sacrifice is sufficient for every need in our life. Not only for every sin, Lord, but for every provision that we need. Everything that we need practically in this life comes from what you've provided. So help us to, again, hold on to that, Lord. Help us to hold on as we build our life upon your love. Help us to hold on to your victory at the cross for everything that we need is there. Thank you. We receive this now in Jesus' name. Let's drink together. Well, amen. God bless you. You're loved. Have a great week. We'll see you next weekend, hope.